go with me to uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews. We've been talking the last Sunday or two about our confession. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Like I've said before, when he's telling us to hold fast, that suggests that there is a temptation or some effort being exerted against us to give up our confession. He said, hold on to it. Hold on to your confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Has anybody ever experienced a time of need? Well, there's grace and mercy in every time of need. But it happens as we come boldly for it. We do not receive grace and mercy by whining and complaining, amen, criticizing one another, finding fault with one another, amen. We find grace and mercy available when we come boldly before the throne of grace, holding fast to our confession. That means come boldly to before God saying the right things, amen. Now, I want to, uh, to take our attention today over to Romans chapter 10. We've looked at this, of course, before. But I want to give a little bit more uh, background and maybe uh, put this in a little different uh, light, maybe, than I've done before. In Romans chapter 10, we often read verse 9 and 10, and, and that's, that's certainly a, a good focal uh, point of this passage. But I want us to go back to verse number five and start there. And it says, for Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or do not say who will descend into the abyss That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now we preach the word of faith. Moses is talking about what Moses said. Concerning uh, what we're talking about here. Putting it in our mouth and in our heart. Go back with me to Deuteronomy. And look at the the 29th chapter. Let me see. Or the 30th. It's the 30th chapter. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We want to put this into context here. Paul brought up what Moses said. And so there's a reason for that. And it, and it applies to what we're studying here. In the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy 30, Moses said, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea. Now, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit translated that as the abyss. But Moses said it this way, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. 
the point here is that when God instructs us, His instructions are neither mysterious nor hard to lay hold of. What is one of the strong traditions, if you grew up around church, I guarantee you heard this many times growing up. Well, you just never know what God's going to do. Well, God is mysterious and sometimes we don't understand his way. How many of you have ever heard those kinds of things? Am I talking about somebody that's heard that? Yeah. Well, you know, God in his infinite wisdom... He chooses to do things sometimes that we don't understand. And you just can't really ever know. He said the commandments or the word or the instructions of God, he said, are not mysterious. Nor is it far off. It's not difficult. It's not hard to lay hold of. Too often Christians have made the things of God, the Word of God, living the Christian life, being victorious, uh, believing and exercising faith, they've made it difficult. The reason it appears to be difficult is because people don't actually do it. I'm going to say that again. The reason... Some people have the idea that living by faith and living the Christian life and living in victory is not easy, it's difficult, is because you don't really act on what you hear. Because he said it is not difficult. He said, the word is very near you. In your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Paul said that word that's near you in your mouth and in your heart is the word of faith. We've been, we've been given the word of faith so that we can operate in it. Now, I, I, my testimony might be a little bit different than yours, but I suspect there, there are other people in this house that can relate to my testimony. When I, now, I had been raised in church, and I had been saved as a youngster. But as a, a teenager, I fell away from the Lord and became very hard-hearted toward the things of God. And uh, the reason that happened was we were taught, now, now we were taught a lot of good things. When I got back into fellowship with the Lord in the fall of 1972, I, I got back into the Word of God and much that had been sown into me as a child suddenly came alive again. And, and then I was just a, 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 a ferocious, I had this ferocious appetite for the Word of God. I read and fed on the Word of God, I mean, just hours and hours. I couldn't put the Bible down, I just fed on And that was in the fall of 72, and I didn't start going back to church again until early in 1973. But I was feeding on the Word of God. Now, the thing that caused me to fall away was that as a youngster, we were told certain things that are true. We were given the scriptures, the Bible. But then there were traditions that were added in, and the traditions and the biblical principles were irreconcilable. For instance, we were taught that divine healing is provided for all in the atonement. But the traditions that came along with that was when someone didn't get healed, they said, well, sometimes the Lord chooses not to heal people. Well, that's, that's, that, those two were not con reconcilable. We were taught that if you tithe and bring your offerings in, that God will bless you. I heard that all of my life. He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. And yet people in our church very often did not prosper. And we heard things like, well, sometimes, you know, it's, it's sometimes God just, you know, he, 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 uh, uh, prosperity and, and, and wealth and abundance really isn't for everybody. Sometimes it's God's will that we, that we go through life and, and, and have it hard. We heard that. We heard a lot of things that uh, caused me, as, as I began to listen and get older, uh, they didn't add up. My father being killed uh, unexpectedly in an accident when I was 11 years old really shook me. 
because he was a godly man, a man very well respected, and uh, we were taught that if you serve God, it'll turn out good for you. And my father was killed. And then I would go to school, and of all of my classmates, not just my class, you know, classroom, but all of those in my age group, there were like four, you know, three or four different classrooms at my elementary school of my age. So my friends that I had been in different classes with, you know, for the pre previous uh, five years in school, I probably had the worst case of anybody. I didn't know of anybody else whose dad was killed. And here I am, I'm sitting in class and I'm looking around, and I've been told all of my life that if you serve God, it'll go well with you and you'll, you'll do well than other people that don't know God. And I'm sitting there without a dad. And all of my friends who don't go to church and I hear them talking and their parents drink and, and, and you know, just live ungodly lives. They still have their dad. Well, that, that you know, that, that soured me. Then I had a couple of aunts that died of cancer. And these things kept happening in my family and, and we, would, we would pray for healing and some people would get healed and other people didn't and they died. And when they died, people said, well, it was the will of God. Well, if it's the will of God, then why are you praying for people? How could you ever know? Obviously, we didn't know because we prayed for them and they still died. When my grandfather died and I was a young teenager, probably 14, I'm, I think, about 14 years old. And now you say, well, grandparents die. I know, but he wasn't old enough to die. He should not have died when he did. And I won't go into all that, but he died. And I remember telling my mom at that time, you know, it, it upset me. And I, and I remember telling her, you know, if this is what serving God is all about, I don't want any of it. If God doesn't take care of his own children any better than he's taking care of us. I looked around to the other people that lived on, on one side of me was a man who was an alcoholic he, and, and came home and when he, was, when he would come home, he would get drunk. He, he was a truck driver, an over-the-road truck driver. When he was home, he would come home, get drunk and beat his wife. And we would hear her screaming at night. And on the other side was a, was a family that were insane. I mean, they were just, uh, they were wild. They cussed each other out constantly and, and were in the yard fighting and stuff. And they got sick, we got sick. They got laid off, we got laid off. If the, I couldn't see any difference. And when this happened to my grandfather, I told my mom, and I know, it, I know it broke her heart. I'm sure it really encouraged her to pray for me more than she had. But I said, Mom, I'm not interested in serving this God. I don't want anything to do with it. And so as a teenager, I grew further and further away from the Lord. Well, when I got back into fellowship with the Lord in 1972, I had, I had come to, to the end of my rope, so to speak. I had come to the end of me. I was doing everything I could to, to, to untether myself from my religious past and my church past. And I was really perilously close to denying Christ in my heart. I, I, I just saying, I don't want Jesus. I don't want, I don't believe he's the son of God. I don't believe any of that. I was close to that. And, and I, 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 I was troubled. I was, uh, I was not happy. I was lonely. And I, 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 in, in an hour of desperation, a moment of desperation, I'm in a hotel room down near Tampa in Brooksville, Florida. And I turn on the TV and Billy Graham is preaching. And I just sat down on the, on, in the chair and, and listened. And you know what happened. God got a hold of me. Well, I knew that there, there were things that, that weren't reconcilable in my mind with the Bible and, and all the traditions, the way it was interpreted and the way it was applied. But I was determined to find out the truth. I was determined to find out the truth. And so, like I said, I read the word of God. I mean, I just read it, uh, you know, hours on end. In every waking moment, I would read the Bible. And, uh, and I read primarily at first in the Gospels. 
And I found this person, Jesus, to be the most amazing, uh, magnificent, such, such a, uh, an impression he made on me, his, his life and his, his majesty. As a, as a man, not in heaven, but walking this earth. And it fueled something on the inside of me. But I still had all these questions. And so I started going back to church because I read enough in the Bible that I knew that if Christians are supposed to go to church. I said, according to the Bible, Christians are supposed to go to church. Whether you agree with everything or not, you know, you could be wrong. <laughs> Whether you agree with everything that's said or not, you still need to go to church. Well, I knew I went back to the church that I left. The church that Pastor Angela talked about last Sunday night. I, I went back to that church. She didn't go right away, but I did. Because I realized from reading the Bible that you have to go to church. The, the church is where God's people assemble. God has ordained the local church, so I started going. But I still had all these conflicts. And I needed to know how the word of God should really be applied in my life. I wanted to live a victorious life. Now, I didn't know anything about prosperity. Other than we were told if you tithe, you, you'll do well in life. But I hadn't always seen that. But as far as having a covenant of, of prosperity, I didn't know anything about that. I really didn't know much about our rights and our covenant rights for healing. But we, I knew our church believed in healing. And we prayed for the sick and people got healed. But a lot of people didn't. So I didn't know a whole lot. But I was determined to find out the truth. Because I, I, knew, I knew this much by reading the Bible that God intended for me to live differently. God intended for me to have power in my life. Somehow, I, I don't know that I mentally put this together, but somehow in here I knew that if you are saved, if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and make him Lord of your life, you can live like him. And I'd never seen anybody do that before. But in, I somehow I, I understood that. I began to, to go back to church. And I, I hadn't been going but just a week or two. And somebody gave me a book that contained the word of faith in it. The message of faith in God. It was a book by Kenneth Hagin. I got a hold of that book and I got a hold of a book by him entitled The Authority of the Believer. And when I read it, I realized this is what has been missing. This connected all of the dots, all of the promises of God. This is how it works. And that's why Paul said, this word that we preach is the word of faith. Thank God for the word of faith. I, I, I laid hold of it in 1973. Now, have I always gotten it right? No. Have I always won? Have I won every uh uh, skirmish, every battle that I've been? No. But I can tell you this, I've won most of them. I've won consistently over the years and God has been true to his word. And I've grown in it. Now I've learned how it operates. And it operates just exactly the way it says it does. And, and here's the message that, that I've already uh, alluded to. The word is not far off from you. Your victory in Christ is not somewhere else. It's not mysterious. It's not hard to lay hold of. It's not tricky. It's not, there, there, there are not uh, exceptions. The word is near you. Moses said it's very near you. The word is very near you. Where is it? In your mouth and in your heart. Now let me say this. I wish I had a little pocket New Testament. When it says the word is near you, it's not talking about having it in your pocket. It's not talking about having it on your uh, 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 bookshelf. It's not talking about having your family Bible uh, in a prominent place on your coffee table or on the mantle of your fireplace. It's not what it's talking about. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. But 
if it's not in your mouth and in your heart, it's not near you. If it's not in your heart and you don't get it in your mouth, you can, you can make a little room out of Bibles and sleep in it and it won't be near you. Only, only you and I can put the word in our heart. God will not and cannot do that. And only you and I can put the word in our mouth. But Moses said, "This it's in your mouth and it's in your heart so that you may do it. Again, the reason a lot of people have, have struggled with faith is because they've never done it. They've never put it in their heart and in their mouth and then acted on it. Well, praise the Lord. But it is, it is just that simple, church. It's just that real. It's just that attainable. The, 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 the Christian life, the life in Christ, the God life, the power life, the overcoming life, the victorious life, the healthy life, the prosperous life, the wise life, the free life is near us. If we'll put it in our mouth and put it in our heart, glory to God, we can act on it. Hallelujah. I, I know I started with a, with a brief, you know, just short amount of time, so I've just gotten it introduced, what I wanted to say. I've got my introduction done today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'm telling you, I started putting this in my heart when I first got back into fellowship with the Lord in that hotel room in Brooksville, Florida. I started hiding God's word in my heart. And I didn't understand it. I didn't, I, I, I didn't know what I know now. I didn't understand it. But it was so thrilling to me. And I've never lost that thrill for the word of God. It, was, it, it, it's, it, took, it took a hold, if you can say it that way. It took hold of my spirit, man, when it got in me. Oh, glory to God. And when I got a hold of um, uh, books by Kenneth Hagin on faith, I realized this has been the, the missing link. This is, how, this is how all these things, we, I had been taught the right things except how to do them. Well, glory to God. God has been faithful to me. He's been faithful to me all of these years. And in the years to come, he will be even more faithful. Or I could say it like this, I will lay hold of even more of his faithfulness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And what he's done for anybody, he'll do for you. What works, the principles of the word of God that work for anybody will work for everybody if they'll do it. Glory to God. Get serious. Get serious about your faith life. Your faith life is the key to the God life. Faith is the key to the God life. It's the, it's the key to the overcoming life. It's the key to laying hold of all of the provisions that affect not just your health and your income and your, and your you know, victory over problems, your faith is your key to your, the way you live, your conduct, how you behave yourself, how you treat people, what kind of testimony you have, what difference you make in other people's eyes. Faith is the key to it. This word of faith which we preach. Glory to God. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Hallelujah. You can do anything and everything the Bible says you can do. Hallelujah. You can have it all. Well, praise the Lord.